accepting help. Our church was incredible and we just had like meals for weeks. And so just accept any help that anyone wants to give you and also set limits. Like I still have a hard time being around babies, but like, especially then. So it's like, yes, you can come visit and bring me a meal. Please don't bring your baby. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where you'll gain the knowledge and confidence you need to erase the unknowns of pregnancy and birth and rock the newborn days like a boss. My name is Liesl Team. I'm a fellow mom, labor and delivery nurse, and your host. Each week on this podcast, you'll hear a mix of birth stories, expert interviews, and other fun pregnancy and birth related content. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now let's get into this week's episode. This week on the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, I am airing a special episode in honor of Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day, which is observed on October 15th every year. According to Awareness Days, the day was established in 2002 in order to honor, celebrate, and remember babies who have passed away due to miscarriage, stillbirth, neonatal death, and other causes of infant loss. Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day serves to promote greater awareness, remembrance, and support of the estimated one in four individuals and families whose lives are irrevocably altered by the death of their children during pregnancy, at birth, and in infancy. The aim of the day is to raise awareness of the need for support, encourages people to talk, and it honors the babies who have passed. On this day, many countries around the world come together to participate in the international wave of light, where cities and countries light up famous buildings and land marks in honor of this day. You can join in too by lighting a candle at 7 p.m. local time to honor all babies gone too soon. Keep your candle lit for at least one hour to create a continuous wave of light across all time zones covering the entire globe. For our special episode this week, I had the chance to chat with Danielle and she shared the birth story of her daughter, Rosie, with me. Rosie was stillborn in December of 2021 when Danielle was 37 and a half weeks gestation. It was all completely unexpected. It always is so special when mamas reach out to share the story of their stillborn babies, and it is my absolute honor today to share Danielle and Rosie's story with you. Hi, Danielle. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Thanks so much for being here today with me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Can you start by telling our listeners about yourself, your family, where you live, what you do, anything at all you want to share? Sure. So I'm married to my lovely husband, Chris, and we're both from upstate New York, and we moved to Durham, North Carolina nine years ago when we got married. Chris works as a night shift charge nurse for the medical ICU, and I work part-time as a psychiatric nurse practitioner for a hospital that specializes in adolescents with eating disorders, and we both love what we do, and I've always joked that when I go in for my deliveries that I'm bringing my own ICU nurse with me just in case things go downhill quickly. (laughs) Yeah, that is so funny. So yeah, we were talking before the episode and I didn't know that's what you did. And I'm like talking to you about BLS. I'm like, yeah, it's basic life. Your support, you're probably like, Liesl, I know what that is. (laughs) So funny. Yes, we're very acquainted with the medical field. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah. And we have three beautiful daughters. We have Lily, who's four, Holly, who's two, and Rosie, who is still born in December of 2021, whose story I'm sharing today. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to get into her story. So what I usually have people do is kind of go back to wherever you feel appropriate to go back to if you want to start with, you know, when you found out you were pregnant with her, or if you think it would be good to touch on, you know, your first two as well, wherever you want to start, and then we can get into birth story. Yeah, it probably is helpful to just give a little background. So we had trouble getting pregnant initially and had an early loss as our first pregnancy. And then with Lily, our oldest, I went into spontaneous labor a couple of days after my due date. And I was hoping to not have an epidural, but I got stuck at nine and a half centimeters for like a few hours, got an epidural and then couldn't feel anything and had to push for a really long time to get her out. And obviously first baby, but it was like over two hours and just felt really hard, but it was still a really good experience. And then for Holly, our second, 
I also went into spontaneous labor like the day after her due date and things went a little more quickly and I didn't end up getting stuck. And so I was able to have her without an epidural. And that was a really incredible experience. Basically, my body just pushed her out on its own in like two minutes and I didn't have to put any work into it. And yeah, that was a really great experience for us, even though it was like the height of COVID, like three weeks into COVID. That sounded interesting because it sounds like you felt what we call the fetal ejection reflex where your body just takes over and pushes that baby out. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like vomiting. It just is happening to you. Yeah. That's a very, very, very good way to put it. It is exactly like vomiting. Well, let's fast forward to when you found out you were pregnant with Rosie. Yeah. So right after Holly turned a year, it was like our first month trying and we were shocked that we got pregnant right away and super excited to, you know, just to have like three kids right in a row like that. And then we also did like an early gender, like at home test and found out it was another girl. And that just felt really exciting. I joked about how we we're going to have a little sorority here. And so, yeah, it, things progressed normally. I mean, like it was my third pregnancy. I knew what to expect. And I just like went to all the appointments. I did do a couple of like extra scans at like these little local boutiques where you can just go and like see the heartbeat for a few minutes or I verified the gender at like 15 weeks doing that. And it was just for fun and just got to see her. And the pregnancy, it was just like my others. I was super sick. I'm miserable pretty much the whole time I'm pregnant. And but like generally healthy as far as like blood pressure, gestational diabetes, like none of those problems. I will say I was sick quite a bit during the pregnancy, like a lot of colds. I did get COVID at 13 weeks, which was no fun, but was fine. I think like two or three GI bugs. It just seemed like one thing after the next, like I just couldn't stay well. Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. And we had a couple of extra like medical scans because at our anatomy scan, they couldn't see all of her heart. And so we went back and had another scan and that looked good. And then the protocol at the time for anyone who had COVID in pregnancy was to get a growth scan at 32 weeks. And so we went back for that scan and she looked great. She was growing well. And so, you know, everything was on track Um, and we were ready for her. We got all the baby stuff back out and washed all the clothes and stuff away and bought loads of diapers and all the things we were we were ready for her. Yeah, yeah. So 32 weeks, you're like prepping and tell me time frame kind of when this was. Like when were you like at about this time? Yeah, that was last fall, like last October fall. Okay. time. Which is actually interesting just to point out that I love listening to birth stories. And so I listen to the birth hour a lot. And during October last year, she played a lot of lost stories for infant loss and pregnancy loss remembrance. And I didn't know at the time, but those were really preparing me for my own experience, which was only about six weeks later. Wow. Yeah, that's really powerful to say. Wow. Well, let's talk about those next six weeks and how that was. And then we can get into, you know, what ended up happening after six weeks. Yeah. I mean, they progressed just like normal. I just kept getting more and more uncomfortable and having more trouble sleeping. All of my appointments were fine. My sweet friends threw me like a little baby celebration when I was 36 weeks. And then that was a Friday on the Monday after that celebration. I went for my 37 week appointment. I was exactly 37 weeks. And midwife said, everything's looking great, you know? And I said to her, do I need to come back next week? Like everything's been great. I told her like, I'll monitor my blood pressure at home if you want me to like, and she did say to me, like, you know, I don't think you need to come back next week, but make sure to like call us if you notice any change in movement. Gotcha. And so I felt like my providers did their due diligence and educated me enough. And I had the information that I needed. But yeah, she was like, you don't need to come back. So we'll see you in two weeks and maybe sooner if you have the baby, you know. And so that was Monday. Yeah, I want to interject really quick and ask and just comment on... I'm glad that you said you felt like your providers had everything under control because oftentimes I hear, I know I've had Amanda on very early podcast episode where she talked about her daughter, Juniper, who was still birth at, I think she was 37. I can't remember off the top of my head, but but term. And she talked about the opposite where she felt like her providers did not have everything in control. And she's like, my baby was obviously, now that I look back, not growing, you know, adequately, like this was wrong, this, that, and the other was wrong. So you've really are saying that you felt like it was the, like everything, everybody was doing the right things. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know like there's a big push to end preventable stillbirth, but I really don't feel like ours was preventable. Yeah, yeah, that's important to say. Yeah. So getting into her birth story, I feel like for me, it really starts that Wednesday night. So I saw the midwife Monday. And then on Wednesday, we took our oldest daughter, Lily, to see Disney on ice. It was awesome. And on the way there and on the way back, I had a kick so hard that I like gasped. And so my husband was driving and he thought like something was in the road. Like he kind of freaked out. And I was like, oh no, it's just the baby. Like she just kicked me really hard. And I want to point that out too, because I've connected with a lot of of other lost moms that have had similar experiences where they had like an increase in movement or like frantic movement or like bigger kicks than normal before everything went still. And like, I didn't know that that was a warning sign. I probably now if that were to happen, like would surely go in, but I just thought like, Oh, like she's all cramped up in there, you know, like it's movement. That's a good thing. Right. And didn't really think anything of it. And those were the last distinct times I can remember feeling her move. Interesting. I'm glad you're saying that as well, because that's also something that is recently we're also figuring out like, oh, hey, wait a second. Obviously, we know that decrease in movement is something that we want to be aware of. But I mean, I know personally, I only learned what you just said. The increase, the sporadic movements is actually, you know, a warning sign that you need to tell your provider about. I've only learned this in the last few years. And I think it's Still, there are people who are not aware that that's actually something that we need to tell moms about. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me now, you felt that kick, that big kick in the car. And then what happened? So then Thursday morning, I woke up and I worked Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that was my last day at work. And I was really busy wrapping a lot of things up. And my sweet coworkers like threw a little baby celebration for me at the end of the day. We had cupcakes and they gave me money for newborn photos and we were just, you know, celebrating her. And I went home and I was feeling really exhausted. But we did go for a short walk as a family and then we had dinner and then Chris left for work. Like I said, he works night shifts. So he left around 6 p.m. And I did the evening routine with the girls, like baths and getting them in bed, which is busy and distracting. And like I said, I was exhausted. And by the end of it, once they were finally in bed, I felt really awful. Like I was starting to have like shakes and headache. And I was like thinking, oh no, I'm getting COVID again. Like this can't be happening so close to delivery time. Like I even took my temperature, which was normal, but I felt awful. And so I just got in bed. And that was when I was like, you know, I don't remember feeling her move a lot today. And so I thought, okay, like I need to do kick counts. And this was probably around like 9, 9.30. And I ended up falling asleep because I was just feeling so miserable and exhausted. And so I did not do those kick counts. And then I woke back up at midnight and I was again, like uncontrollable shakes, like chills and just instantly like knew something was wrong. And she usually moved a lot at night and I was like, she's not moving at all. I fell asleep and I was supposed to be doing those kick counts, like something is not right here. And so I texted Chris right away that I was worried and I went down and I got a snack and drank and moved all around and changed positions in bed and poked and prodded her and was getting nothing. And then I pulled out our home Doppler, which I only used a handful of times and I hadn't used it in a while. And so I pulled it out and I like wasn't getting much or anything. And I knew that I was really anxious too. Like maybe I'm just not doing this well. And maybe I'm just too anxious to be doing this correctly right now. And I would kind of pick up something and I was like, that could be my heartbeat. If it is a baby's, it's really low. And so that got me like worried to the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to just call the provider because I think the handbook that they gave us says like, do kick counts for two hours. But I was like, no, this just doesn't feel right. And so after 30 minutes, I paged the midwife and they're supposed to call you back, but I didn't hear anything. So when I paged again and I still didn't hear anything, turns out my whole number wasn't going through. And so they didn't know who was calling. So I finally just called the LND unit and said like, I'm coming in. And they got a hold of the midwife. She called me and after talking to her, she was like, yeah, you definitely need to come in. And so here it is like middle of the night and I have two kids here sleeping. And so I called one of my friends who lives close by and thankfully her phone was not on silent and she rushed over. And in the meantime, I just threw a last few things into our hospital bags that was also pretty much packed and ready to go. 
And, uh, you know, it was like, just in case. And so threw that in the car and then sped off to the hospital. And I remember being really anxious on the drive and like still feeling nothing and just being like, just trying to prepare myself for the worst case scenario. But I was also like, we're not going to go to the worst, worst case scenario, like the worst case scenario of like emergency C-section tonight and like get her out. And so got to the hospital, got up to L&D and... Chris was meeting me over there because he works at the hospital we deliver at. And so the midwife was like, do you want to get started? And I was like, yeah, like we don't need to wait for him. You know, whatever it is, it is. So she started looking with the Doppler and then he got there and he hadn't even badged out of work. He left all the stuff over there. He thought like, oh, this is just going to be a quick reassurance and Danielle's anxious and I'll just be back to work in no time. And so he came over and She was again, like picking up something and um, which was my heartbeat, but, and I think she probably knew that, but she was like, well, I'm just not sure here. I'm going to call in the resident. And I think like both of us at that point just knew like, this is really bad. And so when the resident came in, she immediately did an ultrasound and it was just up on the screen. And like both of us being in healthcare and having had so many scans, like it was just immediately obvious to me that she was gone. Like I could see all four heart chambers just not moving, which is something that I think will just be like burned on my memory forever. I'm sure. Yeah. She didn't say anything for a minute. And I think she just wanted to make sure, but like I had to ask her, like, there's no heartbeat, is there? And she said, I'm sorry, no. And that, like, I just can't describe like how instantly that just like shatters your world. Oh, yeah. It's the worst sentence that you want to hear. Yeah. Especially at almost 38 weeks when everything is ready. So I just started sobbing and pretty much just like screaming no over and over and over again. Like I just couldn't believe like, no, this can't be happening. Like, no, this isn't me. Like this happens to other people. Like I knew, you know, I knew that silver was a thing, but it was just not on my radar at all for us. And so sometime during that time, the attending came in just to verify and like look for blood flow or something like that. I really don't remember any of that. Also during that time, like Chris's coworkers brought his stuff over. He called our parents to let them know what was going on. And then once I was able to kind of like calm down enough to have a conversation it was like, okay, well, what do we do now? And I mean, I knew I was like, now I have to deliver a dead baby. Like that's the only way out of this. And so there was a lot of talking about what testing we wanted to do, if any, to like, see if we could find a cause. And so they offered things like all sorts of blood work to look for like viruses and clotting and stuff in me, amniocentesis, autopsy of the baby, MRI of the baby, genetic testing, like all these different things. And they pretty much told us that it was a low likelihood of finding anything given the fact that we have two healthy children and that she looked perfect on all of her scans. And so we opted out of a lot of those things. I basically said like, whatever you can get just taking blood work for me, go ahead and do, and we won't do the rest of it. And the only thing that came up from that was they found basically her entire blood volume, like over 300 mils of her blood was in my circulatory system. And so, I mean, the explanation for that was just like her blood went to the placenta and instead of going back to her, it went into me. And we don't know if that's like a cause or an effect. We don't know if it happens after she died, like, we just never got a good explanation for that. Yeah. I wonder if it was, you think it's something, I mean, I guess you you really don't know, but maybe something with her heart chambers where one of them was going like the wrong way. That's no idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we've seen several specialists and no one really gave us an answer for that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And sometimes I'm glad you said that they offered, you know, all these things. Sometimes also we'll say, well, you always say that, We can wait until baby's born because sometimes when you have the baby, it's obvious like, oh, there was a cord accident. The cord was this way or, oh, by looking at the placenta, we can tell that this is the cause as well. Yeah. And we were hoping for something like that. And they did like send the placenta to pathology, but nothing really came from that either. Nothing. Yeah. And usually with our patients and you can, I'll let you continue your story. Usually with our patients if they come in, regardless of what week they are, if they, you know, it's deemed that baby is stillborn, we'll give them the option, unless for some reason they're starting to get septic or, you know, there's a real emergent reason for you to be staying in the hospital, we'll usually say, hey, if you want to go home, gather your stuff and then come back later for an induction. 
Or if you want to stay here, we can go ahead and induce you. And I'd say it's about 50-50 for people saying, some people are like, I need time. I need to go home. I need to call people. I need to do all the things. I want to come back tonight or tomorrow. And then the other half of people are like, nope, we need to just do this right now. Yeah. And they gave us that option also. And I was just like, nope, just what's the next thing we need to do? Do it. Yeah. 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 And so there were a lot of decisions. I will add, like, I like to be well informed and go into things kind of knowing my options. And I had not planned for any of this. I hadn't even planned for an induction because both my others just came. And so, yeah. So after making all the decisions about like testing, it was then time to like make decisions about how to proceed with the induction. So they moved us to an L&D room and we got started right away when the day shift midwife came on, I think like 6.30. And so we started with a Foley balloon and Cytotec. And so that was in for about five hours. And like, I didn't feel anything. I was just like, this isn't going to work. But I guess did something and it did come out then. So I was in about four centimeters. And during that time, like, I mean, I, (laughs) during my other births, it was very like, walk, change position, sit on the ball, like do all the things. And this time that kind of just all went out the window. And I basically just sat in bed and cried and then like called different people and just made arrangements for things. So my parents were in New York and they were flying down. And so I was arranging for them to have transportation to the hospital. And I basically just sent a text to like several of my closest friends and was like, this is what's happening. I need you guys to figure out amongst yourself how to take care of the girls all weekend. And they did. They were my friends and and our support here is just incredible. And we had a couple of visitors in the morning. One of our pastors came and then the chaplain for the hospital also came and saw us in the morning. And then after the fully bulb, I think that we just gave it time to see if my body would kind of start going into labor on its own. And during that time, our closest friends came and just sat with us for a little bit and just kind of talked. Also, my favorite midwife who was actually leaving the practice and it was her last day that day, she was in the hospital with students and she came up and sat with me for quite a while and just talked through a lot of things. And she was the one who suggested having the girls come, which I didn't even know was an option. And I'm really glad she did because we did end up doing that. But yeah, so just have visitors, people coming to try to support us. And then we decided that the next step would be breaking my water because with my other two births, as soon as they broke my water, like things really intensified and went pretty quickly. And that seemed to make a big difference. And so, but the question was, was I going to get an epidural or not? Because if I was going to get it, I should get it before we do that. And that was a hard decision for me. And I talked to the midwife about it because I was just like, my experience with epidurals has been with an epidural, I could feel nothing. I had to work really hard at pushing for hours. And I don't think that I could do that for a dead baby. And, you know, without the epidural, my body just did all the work. But I also don't know if I can, you know, get through a whole labor, especially like with Pitocin for a dead baby. Like, I just don't know that I emotionally have it in me today to do this. And so we came to the conclusion to go ahead with an epidural. They did like some sort of light version. The placement was really difficult. That was maybe one of the most difficult parts of the delivery. I was just kind of a disaster emotionally. And then it was kind of painful. They had to try several times. And that was really, really hard on me. And my blood pressure like spiked. They ended up like running tests for like preeclampsia. They were like, oh, I gosh. stress. <laughs> no, yeah, of um, course. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta, you know, so, do your due diligence. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So got the epidural in and it was actually the perfect epidural. I could still move my legs all around. I could still go to the bathroom on my own. I could still feel contractions, just not the pain. And so that was pretty much perfect. And I'm glad that I did it because then we had like more people come in the afternoon and I was just able to actually like interact with them and, you know, get some sort of support from them rather than kind of just like being in labor land. So my parents arrived around three. One of our pastors came pastor's wife came and then our doula showed up also. She's a close friend of mine when she was there for our first delivery, not our second because of COVID, but she was planning on coming for Rosie and she had the afternoon off. And so when I told her what was happening, she just packed up her essential oils and her acupressure book. And she showed up and just did a really amazing job of helping me stay calm, um, which was really important. Yeah. So I think breaking my water got me to like a six or so, but kind of 
not much more than that. And then once my parents were here in North Carolina and on their way to the hospital, I was like, let's get this going. Like, I don't want to be at this all night. And like, I want people to be able to come this evening to see us. And so I started Pitocin and that was fine. Like I said, with the epidural, like I just, I could feel contractions, but they weren't painful. And so we did that for just a couple hours. And again, I just sat in bed and just let it do its thing. And yeah, I just cried a lot. Yeah. And you mentioned that your daughters came. Did your daughters come before or after? They came after. They came in the evening. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes I've seen where children come, even though it's very difficult, but sometimes they need to see beforehand. It depends on the age, obviously, but sometimes they need to see beforehand what's going on for them to process it. But you said your kids are little, so it's a little bit different. But I'm glad that you are talking about that because I had a patient recently who same gestation, 38 weeks, had stillbirth, and she had same third baby. It was a girl. Like it's actually kind of weird, like talking to you and then thinking about her. She kept asking me over and over and over again, like, how do I talk to my kids about that? And I do want to talk to you a lot about that once we get into when they come in and I want you to go. I want you to talk about that a whole lot. But yeah, side note. But let's talk about what kind of happened as, okay, water breaking, and then you're like six or seven centimeters, Pitocin starting. And so then kind of like, as it always goes, like, I'm just, everything's fine and normal. And my husband and my dad left to go get dinner for everyone, like around 630. And it's like, as soon as they leave the floor, I start feeling pressure. I'm like, uh, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. That happens um, so, regardless of the situation, it seems like. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, 6.30 at night. So now we're going on change of shift. Yeah. Um, yep. And so yep. again, just of course. Also the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I was feeling that. And I knew just from my other births, like what that meant. And the baby was going to come soon. And so when the nurse came back in around 6.45 to turn up the Pitocin, I was like, let's hold off on that, please, until the guys get back, kind of just filled her in on what was going on. And we had also like talked with the midwife about kind of how we wanted it to be. And so it was just like mood lighting, like we had Christmas lights strung up. And it was just my parents, Chris, our doula, our friend, and then the midwife and two nurses, the day shift nurse and the night shift nurse. And actually, the night shift nurse was the nurse who was there with us with Holly. So that felt really special that we like knew her. And so, and it was just very quiet. And so, yeah, once the guys got back and then it was like about seven and then it was like, okay, it's, you know, I think she checked me and she's like, yeah, like the head's right here. Like we're ready to go. And so by that point I could feel everything. Like it was almost as if I didn't have enough drill, which was exactly how I'd wanted it. So I was really thankful for that. And I did have to work a little bit, but my body did most of the work, which again, I'm very thankful for. And it was a really smooth delivery. I remember, I mean, I was obviously like working really hard, but then I remember right when I knew like, okay, this is it. Like all of a sudden, like wanting to backpedal and be like, no, 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 no. And I I remember saying that, like just screaming it again, because it was like, as soon as she's out, this is real. Like this pregnancy is over and she's really dead. And there's like no going back and no question about it. And that felt really scary all of a sudden. But it was like, she's coming. What are you going to do? And so yeah, she was delivered. And I mean, it felt just like when I delivered Holly, like I could feel her head and I could feel her little body. And it was really smooth. I'd asked the midwife, like what to expect, like with a baby that can't really do their part, you know, maybe like kind of twist a little bit. And she said that it shouldn't be like that much different. And I think the midwife did kind of turn her a little bit to get her out. They put her right on my chest and and it was just like peaceful. Like they don't I don't even think they broke down the bed. Like the midwife was just sitting on the base of the bed and it was just really peaceful. And, you know, if she'd been living, it would have been like the perfect birth experience. There was, but obviously she wasn't living. And so it was very different because there was no hustle and bustle. There were no extra people. It was like, even where they normally have the warming table for the baby, there was a death cart. That's what we call them at our hospital. It's like a little tray with like snacks and coffee and stuff. So like that was in place of the warming table. There was no baby screaming and it was just adults sobbing, which is a really awful, awful sound. And so we had also asked the midwives like what to expect, like what might she look like? And, you know, the answer I got was she might be a little mottled or bruised. There was meconium. She might be a little greenish. There wasn't for us. And that her skin would be really fragile and possibly like breaking down. 
And so she came out and she looked perfect. And I mean, even my husband said that he thought for a minute, like they made a mistake and she was just absolutely beautiful, but she did feel fragile. Like her skin felt fragile to me and she had no tone. So she was just extremely like floppy and loose. And so they just, yeah, they put her on my chest, just like my other babies and Chris cut the cord. And then, you know, I held her and cried and then he held her and cried. And then, you know, the midwife kind of like worked on me a little bit, which was easy for my first two deliveries. I just needed one stitch each. And for this time, didn't need any stitches at all. So that was a really big blessing that there was not a lot of like physical recovery because there was certainly a lot of emotional recovery. We'll definitely get into all of that. So I'm sure placenta came out totally fine. And you're saying, you know, didn't need any stitches. So that's good. So did you stay, I don't know what hospital you delivered at, but did you stay in, a lot of times we'll have our patients just stay in the same room. So it's like no transfer, nothing like that. So we were at UNC. We stayed there for quite a while. So she was born at like 7, 18 at night. We ended up having a lot of visitors. Well, first we we actually, we did a bath for her, like a sponge bath. And mm-hmm. they did her like measurements and everything. And she was huge. She was 7 pounds, 14 ounces, 19 inches long. And if she'd had her full blood volume, she would have been my biggest baby. And she was three weeks earlier than her sisters. So wow. So she was obviously growing well. Placenta was working well. Like everything was going great until it wasn't. I was just going to say, it just makes you want to just shake your head and just, I mean, it's, it's so frustrating when you just don't everything looks just fine everything's fine yeah like well, why like, did this what happen in the world happened yeah and yeah so we did those things she also like she just looks so perfect and I talked to the midwife about it and they were like yeah she was not gone long like no I think yeah. that I caught it like as soon as I possibly could and you know and I asked them about that because it's certainly there's a bit of like guilt and just anxiety like did I miss this and you know they said I asked them I was like do people ever catch it or is it like either a false alarm or too late like when people go in for decreased movement and my midwife said it's usually a false alarm or too late and so yeah I think that she had not been gone long at all when I you know noticed it and went in right away I don't think there's anything more that I could have done no I don't think so I'm glad that you mentioned that though because that is something that I think regardless of how long the baby looks to be gone. That's what I think all moms in that situation carry with them. Like, oh my gosh, did I do something or did I not bring this up soon? You know, could I have brought this to the attention of my provider sooner? And it's such a heavy guilt that moms, you know, place on themselves. Yeah. And just regardless of the situation, it is not mom's fault. No, never. These things just happen sometimes, which is awful. Well, let's get into, you said they did her measurements and you said bath. What were they telling you in terms of how long we need to stay? Do, you know, because sometimes we'll let moms go home, you know, go home earlier than, you know, than normal. Yeah. So they left that up to us. And, but they did say that they would ask us politely to leave by Sunday morning. And so for us, it felt right to want to spend the time with her and to want as many people to come and meet her and hold her and love on her as we could. And so that's exactly what we did. And so Friday evening, we probably had about 20 people come and see us, including they brought the girls. And so that was really bittersweet just to see them interact. And I know you said you wanted to talk a bit about this. And so we had kind of talked before Lily came in and I'd asked my friend who was with her just to not say anything until, you know, she got there. And then we basically just said like, this is Rosie. Rosie came, like she's here and she can't come home with us. She's in heaven with Jesus. And we kind of just stuck to that like line, like she can't come home with us as to just like keep it simple for her brain. But I am so, so grateful that the midwife suggested that they come in because I feel like that just provided like a lot of closure for Lily, especially. I mean, Holly was like a a year and a half old. A little, she yeah. Really clueless. Yeah. But Lily like knew Rosie was coming at Christmas and that was going to yeah. be her baby sister. And I think if we had just come home from the hospital empty handed, it would have been very confusing for her. And so I think the fact that she was able to go and see Rosie and hold her and kiss her and hug her and know just like, but she can't come home with us, I think was 
hopefully even into the future will be helpful for her. And that's something like she, you know, cause she's still little. And so she'll still like ask questions about her and, and I'll like remind her like, no, like Rosie did come. Remember you got to go hold her, but she just couldn't come home with us. And it's really sweet. She often will pray for another baby. And then she always adds that we can bring home. <laughs> so. Yeah. Cause I mean, that makes sense in her mind, you know, as a four-year-old, you're thinking how to explain this to them. Yeah. Did you read any certain books with her or do any certain things afterward to provide her more support or what did she ask any questions? She did like for a little bit, she would ask like, is Rosie still in your belly? Which was really difficult for me. So like trying to have patience with some of her questions and we kind of just like stuck with like that line, like, Rosie came, she can't come home with us. She's in heaven with Jesus. Just to kind of like keep it really concrete and like simple for her. Someone did send me a book called The Moon is Always Round. It's like a faith-based book about stillbirth. And so we've read that a couple of times and we just talk with her about it. Like whenever she brings it up or, and I'm also just like very honest with her. Like I cry a lot even still. And, you know, she'll say like, why are you sad, mommy? And a lot of times now I'll, I'll be like, why do you think I'm sad? She said, you miss Rosie. <laughs> and I said, yes, that's right. So I think that, you know, there's something to be said for like showing your kids that vulnerability and like how to express emotions and that it's okay to express emotions, um, even negative ones. So yeah, that's really powerful. That's really powerful to say. I completely agree. Well, let's talk about discharge the next day, you mentioned that you wanted to have people come, you know, as many people as you needed, you know, come to see her and be with you. But did you end up leaving that Sunday? We did. So we got moved up to the sixth floor of the hospital. You usually go to the fifth floor, but for lost moms, they put them on the sixth floor. And then we did that early in the morning on Saturday. But before we went, the nurses, we had the sweetest nurses, they did these 3D molds of her hands and feet, Yes, which are just amazing. And we just really cherish those. We're so thankful for them. And they also took a bunch of pictures of her and her with us and that sort of thing. When we got moved up to the other unit, we again, just like had visitors pretty much all day. My brother drove down from New York. My in-laws drove up from Florida to get here. And we also had professional photos done. They offer this, I think, as a service you can pay for at the hospital, but they did it for us for free, which I'm so grateful for. Those photos came out just beautiful. And I'm so thankful that we have them. That was really kind of them to offer that for us. Yeah. So we pretty much just had visitors all day Saturday. The girls came again on Saturday and that was when they said their final goodbyes which was really hard and just hard for them to understand that this, no, this is it. Because the first time Lily said, bye Rosie, see you tomorrow. And I had to say, no, like you won't see her again. And then, yeah, we spent the night again and my parents were in town. And for us or for me, it was important to not have all the triggers coming home. And so I asked my parents to just put away all the baby stuff and they did an incredible job. They even like found all my maternity clothes and put those away too. And so when we got home, thankfully, like all of that stuff was not out anymore, which I was really grateful for them to, for doing that. But yeah, our final morning with her, we got more handprints and footprints and we cut little locks of her hair to keep that. We took her like belly button stump. It was just like basically any small piece of her that we could keep, we wanted to. And my parents, they went out and bought something special to leave her in because we had brought home like the outfit that the other girls had worn home from the hospital and it just didn't seem right. Like there was sentimental value for them. And what if we have another baby girl? And so we just didn't want to leave her in that. So we bought her something special that had roses on it and said like sweetie or something like that. And so we changed her into that and swaddled her up and put her back in the cuddle cot and then had to leave the hospital. Those were like the four hardest moments for me were seeing the ultrasound screen. The moment she was born waking up the next morning and realizing that this is all still real and then walking out of the hospital without a baby. Yeah, I can only imagine. You mentioned the word cuddle cot and I want you to explain what that is. Yeah, so we're really thankful we our hospital had several of them. I know some hospitals don't even have any, but it's like a special, it looks kind of like one of those Moses baskets and it has like these coolers 
like built into the bottom of it. And so you put the baby on there and it kind of prevents the baby from deteriorating more quickly and uh, kind of slows down that process, which, you know, they said that they would have asked us to leave on Sunday, but we were ready to because, you know, like her skin was starting to break down and it just, we didn't want to see that anymore. Like that was really hard to watch. And so it was time, like as hard as it was to leave her for the last time, like it was also time to go. Yeah. I want to ask you before we wrap up how your postpartum recovery was. It's different, obviously, because you didn't have a baby. Yeah. Honestly, it didn't even feel like postpartum without a baby. So my milk did come in, which like your body does not get the memo that there's no baby. So the milk came in and my decision was to not pump it. Like some people will pump and donate and I just didn't feel like that was right for me. And so I pumped like a couple times just like for comfort. And then I was also taking hydroxyzine for sleep. And so that I think helped dried it up pretty quickly. So that wasn't a huge deal. Recovery has always been great for me. Like I said, pregnancy is miserable. And then postpartum, I actually feel pretty good, which I know a lot of moms don't. But yeah, but this time, so like previously, my postpartum bleeding had been like really short and light and over really quickly. And this time it was just really like lingering on just with like spotting day after day after day after day. And that seemed just different to me, but I was also like, this whole thing is different. And there's not a lot of information online for like this specific situation. And I was like, and I'm not breastfeeding, maybe that has to do with it. So I went for my six week midwife appointment. And that morning, I actually like passed a piece of tissue. It was like very clearly tissue. And I brought it in with me in a little plastic baggie. I'm sure they love all those little treats. Oh, you know. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so based on that and the fact that I was just like still spotting, I went for an ultrasound and I did have retained placenta, which that just felt like, are you kidding me? Like it's, you know, it's another like very I low risk on the top. of it yes. happening. Yeah. Ugh. I was like, I should play the lottery right now. <laughs> Seriously, um, I know. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, that is a little bit more common with stillbirth, having that retained placenta. But it's still unfortunate <laughs> still when it happens because it's a pain in the butt and it makes you bleed. And did you have to end up having a DNC? So I tried medication to try to expel it. I did that twice. It did nothing. And so then I did have to go in for surgery. I was extremely anxious about the surgery going poorly, just given everything I'd been through. And also very worried about like it leaving scarring and affecting my ability to get pregnant in the future and all these things. And so they kindly did a hysteroscopy for me, which is where they just go in with a camera and just remove what they need to. And they don't like scrape all of the walls of the uterus. So it's, you know, much lower risk of like any scarring or anything like that. And so that was kind of them. But I will say like the whole experience was incredibly re-traumatizing. Like to have to go back to a hospital, put on a gown, get an IV, have a blood pressure cuff on, like it all just felt so much like the delivery and it was, you know, only two months later. So yeah, I was going to ask how long and it's almost, I don't want to say worse if it happens in that time length versus like if it was a few days later, because I'm sure it's just different for everyone. But I feel like it's almost worse because you're healing and then bam, you have to go back in. It's all of these re-triggers. Like you said, two months later, I can only imagine. Yeah. But thankfully, that was kind of the end of that and nothing more with that afterwards. Yeah. Did you find any resources? I know we talked a little bit about the book that you read with your daughter, but did you have any resources that you want to share with our listeners? Like any books that you found helpful? You talked a lot about support and people around you, but any advice for anyone out there, unfortunately, who might have to go through a similar situation? Yeah, I actually sat down and like made a list of like all the things that I've done that have been helpful for me, including like resources like that. So one thing was just accepting help. Our church was incredible and we just had like meals for weeks. And so just accept any help that anyone wants to give you and also set limits. Like I still have a hard time being around babies, but like especially then. So it's like, yes, you can come visit and bring me a meal please don't bring your baby. And so just, you know, speaking up for your needs, basically a lot of self-care, like just making sure I was getting enough rest, like going for pedicures, having like a service come and clean my house just so I didn't have to like worry about that. Lots of distraction, like hobbies. Like I, I've always loved doing puzzles. So I've, 
you know, I've been doing a lot of puzzles and then trying new things like gardening and flower arranging and watching birds and baking. And we also did several movie series, like all the Harry Potter movies and like all the Hunger Game movies, like just to like get out of our world for a couple hours at a time it was just a really nice break. And then also like fiction audiobooks exercise has been really helpful for me. So I do Pure Bar and I recently joined a new studio that opened and that's been a really great outlet for me. Just feeling like I'm getting my body like healthy again and walking and just like being outside has been helpful. Spending a lot of time with friends. I had so many friends and just like women from church that would come and sit with me, especially like after Chris went back to work because I would have the evenings just alone. And so they would just come and basically like sit in grief with me and, you know, just distract and kind of just get me through those really dark early days. And I'm so thankful for them. Um, Also professional help. So I work in the field. So I feel like I had a real leg up on this one. I had been doing therapy like probably every three weeks or so during my pregnancy. And I had a session scheduled for the day after we got home from the hospital, which was just like perfect timing. And so I had that one. And then I did therapy like twice a week for months. And then also I used some connections. When I was a student, I did some clinical hours at the UNC Women's Mood Disorder Center. And so I had connections there and I was able to get an appointment with one of the psychiatrists there the day after we got home from the hospital. And so I was able to, you know, just have help with like, meds to just kind of get me through this. I will say like, I would have expected like the sadness and the depression. The thing that really kind of caught me off guard was like all the anxiety and like the PTSD, just such a huge trauma. And there's a lot of effects from that. So I've been really thankful for like the professional help I've been able to get. We have really good resources in this area. So like finding ways to connect with Rosie. So for us, like her name is Rosie. So like roses, like we get roses every month on the 10th, just to recognize that like she would have been a month older. Cardinals seem to have chosen us. They've shown up at some really just opportune times that just seem like they are a message from her. And so that's been a way that we feel like we connect with her. Another thing is one of my friends sent me a weighted fox. So there's several different organizations that make these weighted animals in the weight that your baby was. So I have this fox that's like custom fabric. It's like a red plaid, just like her swaddle was, and it's her birth weight. And so I've sometimes just like sat and held the fox just because it feels like holding her. And so that is the Jasper Fox Project is who made that. As far as like the PTSD thing, like if I'm falling into like a flashback, I've had some success with using grounding techniques, like the five senses, like what can I feel right now? Like I can feel a fan blowing on me. Like what can I smell right now? Like I can smell the candle. What can I, you know, hear? Like I can hear the clock ticking, just like things like that to kind of help ground me into the moment and not like fully fall down, like into that flashback. Sleep, like just good sleep hygiene. And I found that using magnesium oil spray has been really helpful to help me like calm down and go to bed for a while, like the anxiety. And I was just like, close my eyes and just picture all of the worst moments. And so, yeah, that has been helpful as well as using a weighted blanket. I feel like it just helps my quality of sleep at night. I've done some journaling and then also I've kind of used Instagram. I created an account just for life after loss. And I've used that as a way to kind of like journal my feelings and my process and just like share that with other people. And then keeping Rosie as a part of our lives and everyone is going to be different about this, but that is what feels best to us. So like we have her pictures all throughout our house alongside our other girls. We put her name on like cards, like Easter cards, Christmas cards, that sort of thing. We light a candle for her at the dinner table. My brother had just gotten married. So they did like a tiny little flower girl basket for her, which was really special. And then just like sharing her birth story today is a way to like keep her in our lives. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I'm happy to have stories like this on the podcast because I feel like, you know, we can't just listen like the birth hour. I think she has like a great collection of so many different types of birth stories. We can't just always put the positive ones on. It's important to have these types of stories as well. Yeah. Yeah. As far as like resources. So books and podcasts were not all that helpful. Tons of people send me books, but I did not realize that there are like huge cognitive effects with grief. So it's like, I did not have the focus and attention, concentration, memory to like even try to read those. So only recently I've started a little bit back with that. The one book and content, she has like a website and Instagram that has been probably most helpful for me is Megan Devine. Her book is It's Okay to Not Be Okay. That just like her kind of view on like how some things can't be fixed, they can only be carried. 
just really resonates well with me. Another thing is like connecting with other lost moms has been immensely helpful. And the way that I've chosen to do this is through one ministry called Four Known Ministries. It's a faith-based ministry and they do text support. So they text like almost every single day. They do free monthly Zoom support calls. They have a retreat once a year. And so I went out to Colorado to that retreat in April. And then of course they have Instagram. And so like through them, I've been able to connect with another mom who lost her daughter two days after Rosie. And so we're like really on this trajectory, hitting all the milestones together. And we text like almost every day. I was also able through them to connect with um, Mother of Wild who is actually local to North Carolina. She lost her son and she now does these beautiful remembrance prints for um, lost babies. And so she did prints for Rosie and and I actually went out to meet her just a couple of weeks ago. So that's been really nice. And then just like Instagram in general, connecting with other lost moms who just really get it has been helpful. And then there are also like some helpful Facebook groups where I feel like it's just a good place to get questions answered because there really isn't a lot out there about like, you know, what do I expect with my mail coming in or this or that? It's just, so it's like a good resource for people who have gone through this or are going through it and kind of just get some of those questions answered there. Some other resources to mention, Push for Empowered Pregnancy is an organization that like their whole goal is to end preventable stillbirth. And so they just have a ton of information and statistics like on their website and like different events. I think October 15th, they are pushing 23,000 empty strollers past Congress just because that's about how many babies are stillborn every year. So stuff like that. I'm a big fan of them. We've done stuff together and they have a fabulous page and just fabulous mission. Yeah. Also Count the Kicks. They have a website and an app and that just kind of like helps you get to know your baby's pattern and to notice changes. And I think you can even like set reminders for when you next need to count your kicks and that sort of thing. And so that's another good one. And then of course, October 15th is the International Wave of Light for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance. So Everyone lights candles at 7 p.m. in their time zone. And it's this wave of light across the world to remember all these babies gone too soon. So, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Do you have a page that you want to share with people if people wanted to personally connect with you? Yeah. So I created an Instagram account just for our life after loss. And that is Lampman underscore life after loss. Cool. And I would love for people to connect with me there. Yeah, yeah, great. We'll put it in the show notes page for people to click it and go follow you and check you out. And then I'll also put all of these resources that you mentioned in the show notes as well for people who are looking for resources because I feel like that's oftentimes you know, if you're going through this sort of thing, you're like reaching and grabbing for all these resources. So I love that you had this like complex list. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was an absolute pleasure hearing Rosie's story. Thank you so much for having me. All right, guys, that wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me be a part of your motherhood journey. It is truly an honor. If you like what you heard, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And I love hearing what you guys think of the podcast. So if you're liking what you hear or you have a suggestion, I'd be so grateful if you'd go ahead and leave me a review wherever you're listening to help more mamas just like you find the show. What do you think? Are you starting to feel a little more confident about your pregnancy and birth? Well, if you want more, be sure to head on over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast for today's show notes and a library of episodes so you can keep getting educated before your upcoming birth. And while you're over there, be sure to check out the blog and learn about our online birth classes. Find it all and more over at mommylabornurse.com slash podcast. See you next week. Same time, same place.